Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Tapestry Tuesday presentation for tonight. Uh, it is as you, the woman who dares, Jenny uh, Powers, and is presented to us by Jenna Carroll, uh, who is from the Keene area, and uh, we're glad that the snow has held off so that she can make it tonight, <laughs> and that all of you could make it tonight. My name is Tom Cuthill. I'm with the Center for the Arts uh, of the Santa Fe region, and um, our office is here, and you can see various examples of artworks on the walls here, which are presented by uh, various people, many of which I believe are still for sale. Anyway, so that, uh, uh, our uh, presenter tonight, as I said, is from the Keen area. Uh, she has uh, a master's degree in historical administration, uh, and she has been uh, administering historical societies for 25 years in the mm -hmm. area. She's currently the education director, if I remember correctly, yeah, at the well. Historical <laughs> Society of Cheshire, Cheshire, Cheshire County down in Keene. Uh, and uh, that's, hold on, I wrote a couple of things down here, <laughs> which I managed to lose. <laughs> anyway. She is the uh, recipient uh, 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 from the Keen Sentinel in 2017 of uh, the award for Extraordinary Woman in the Monadnock region. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you like extraordinary women. You like ordinary women as well. Uh, they're all good. Uh, and she also uh, received the President's Award for something from Keene State University. Community, Community Award there, yes. And so she's ready to speak to us. Uh, if um, we, I just found out, we have these headphones. If you can't hear, we can provide you with these and you can put them on so that you can hear it a little bit better. If you're interested. We don't, do they? Well, yeah, it's we'll me, but you sound fine. All right, okay. All right, so without further ado. Thank you. Jenna. Thank you, Jenna. Well, thank you. That was great to have you memorize a lot. <laughs> I was studying. <laughs> um, and I want to thank the Center of the Arts for uh, allowing me to come. Um, our children are away in Florida on vacation right now, so it gave us a chance to it's freezing raining team. So we thought, well, let's spend sure. the night and have dinner. So thank you. My husband Judas with me today. <laughs> so this is lovely. Um, so uh Chudanga. Basket, you'd be my clicker. Did it any this the talk that I'm giving was turned into a um, a mini documentary film, and uh, it's been playing on Hampshire and Vermont Public Television. So uh, you may some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not have, um, but we'll we'll I'll give you a link to that a little later. Um, but very nice to see too that here I travel from Keene and I have one of my volunteers for one of my projects here. If Carolyn's uh -huh. here, um, so another project I'm working on is a recovering Black history project for the Monadnock region, and so we're documenting um, African American history in the area. And it's a citizen archivist project, so we have volunteers assigned to towns, 23 towns, and and so Carolyn's doing Swansea, where I happen to live. So um, I, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but before we start, I just want to say thank you to New Hampshire Humanities, of course, uh, for, for helping to support this program and all that they do to support programs. Um, I also want to thank the Monadnock Humane Society, um, who has been supporting this initiative as well, this, and the Historical Society of Cheshire County, where I am, because that's where that collection is housed. Um, I can tell you that nobody had really studied the life of Jenny Powers. Um, before I started working with the collection uh, about five, six years ago. And uh, what I want to do today is just introduce you a little bit to her life uh, based on what I've discovered to date. But I think what you'll find is a lot of it relates, her life relates to what was happening in New Hampshire. And realizing that nobody lives in a bubble, and local history doesn't survive in a bubble. So Jenny Powers is really a product of her family upbringing. Uh, she's a product of her home life, her uh, work life, and the era. And I think that Jenny Powers is a really wonderful example of a progressive era woman um, in many respects. So we're going to dissect that side of her today. But first, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the progressive era so we're all on the same page. So let's see. Let me turn my page. Um, 
<laughs> Next. So when I say the progressive era, we're talking 1890s to 1920s. It's an era of widespread activism in our country. America's becoming less agricultural, more urban. And a lot of what reformers believed is that there's corruption and vice everywhere, local, state, and national level. So reformers felt that change was possible. Change could lead to one's personal health, the health of one's community, and the health of a nation. So some of you I know, I give this copy, it's like, oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> so if reformers could change the environment in which this vice is running rampant, they could change people. So this was a social movement and it's also a political one. Reformers in, uh, reforms of this era included putting an end to government and corporate corruption, uh, improving workplace safety, safety, limiting child labor, securing a woman's right to vote, conserving land, and a lot of others. Um, and so these, there's many reforms going on at the same time. Next. So women like Jenny Powers are at the forefront of a lot of these movements at the turn of the 20th century in New Hampshire. Prior to the progressive era, era Americans viewed the role of women in society a little differently. Historians often define this point of view as the cult of true womanhood or the cult of domesticity. And it's this concept that women are innocent, helpless, <laughs> physically weak, and morally superior. So as those responsible for keeping moral order, women are charged with the moral education of their children in the home. But band together, these women could preserve the moral order of their communities. So in this era, um, think ladies charitable societies, women's Christian temperance unions. So New Hampshire women everywhere were joining these types of groups because they saw it was their Christian duty to assist the poor and preserve the sanctity of the family. So we're not talking about that generation of women. We're talking about the progressive era tonight. So this is the story of their daughters, the next generation of change makers. Next. So I mentioned America's becoming more urban, more men, women, and children are working outside of the home working long hours for a company that was most often not owned by a family member. In about 1900, almost half the country owned only 1.2% of wealth. Many people in New Hampshire were working class. Many working class men and women faced risky financial security, dangerous working conditions, little to no free time, and poor health. Alcoholism ran rampant with both men and women in New Hampshire suffering. Temperance movements were very active throughout the state. There were more diseases often found in the working class, such as smallpox, influenza, pneumonia, tuberculosis. Infant mortality was high, and accidents on job sites were high. Now consider work animals. Work animals were being overworked by families that depended on them for economic survival. Next. So with these changes in our society, in our own communities, a new generation of women uh, begin to step out of the home to save America from themselves. So with that justification that women are these moral or spiritual guardians, they participated in something that historians call public housekeeping. So progressive era women were going to clean up the mess that others had made before them. They were gonna take better care of children in an effort to decrease infant mortality, upgrade the quality of life of Americans by cleaning up municipal, state, and federal houses, improve the condition of workers, and professionalized jobs that they felt related to a woman's role in society. This is an era where you begin to see nursing and teaching professionalized. Next. So the era of the new woman. Now this is in sharp contrast to what we talked about before. So progressive era women were healthy, independent, hardworking. They questioned authority. They were strong and yet still considered morally superior, and that's important. Next. So new fashion of the day exemplified this new definition of women. 
Gibson girl fashion allowed for tailored suits modeled after men's attire and many working class women in our state wore this style. Gibson girls were daring. They loosened their corsets so they could breathe. <laughs> they liked up to swooping hairstyles. Yeah. <laughs> they might let a little bit of curl down as we see here. Um, so, and this is an era where more women are getting involved in sports. So golf, tennis, bicycling. Um, and so the clothing had to adapt. So new women, um, to allow for this new woman, this physical freedom and healthy outdoor living. The Gibson girl look became every man's dream and, uh, <laughs> and every woman's idea. Next. Now here's a picture of Jenny Powers. So um, this is from a 1906 Boston Post article. And so you can see she exudes some of those new woman qualities that we were just talking about in the last images. She has the tailored suit look, the hourglass figure. Her hair is in the updo, um, just like those pen and ink drawings from the 1890s. Her clothing is professional, but uh, it also makes her look tall. But in reality, she was four foot 11. <laughs> Yay! <Wow>. Yes. <laughs> And I'll tell you, um, now at the Historical Society where I work, we have a cardboard cutout of her because uh, students are beginning to learn about Jenny Powers in school now. And um, so when they come on tour, they, they get to go by and see if they, how they relate in life to her. So every photo around here I want to point out exudes those um, new women quality as well. So healthy, confident, capable, leading decisions. Every single one of these is outside of the home. She's strong and she's not to be trifled with. And um, let me point out as well, she's holding a firearm, which she tended to do in her photos. Uh, so she, she wanted to, to let people know she was not to be trifled with. Um, so one day I had a high school teacher asking me, what do you have in the progressive era, local history, so I can use it in the classroom with my students. Um, so I'm, I'm going through the archives and I run across this series of archival boxes that are highlighted in yellow. And for somebody like me, that's very exciting because it means it's a restricted collection. It's not open to the public, um, but I work there. So um, <laughs> I got to go through the collection and it's the Keene Humane Society collection. So the collection contains items that Jenny Powers herself was saving as the Humane Society's agent uh, in the early 1900s to the 1930s. So the collection has correspondence written to her, publications, mostly Massachusetts SPCA publications, annual reports for the Humane Society, and lots and lots of photographs, which surprised me. And it begged the question like, what is going on here? What's the story of Humane Societies at the turn of the 20th century? And who is Jenny Powers? Because as I mentioned, nobody had really used this collection before. So next. So I put together a team of volunteer sleuths and we read through a lot of Keen Sentinel newspaper articles on microfilm. I always joke that's one sure way to lose a college intern is to uh -huh. set them on microfilm. <laughs> so we went through a lot of interns. <laughs> and there's also the um, Chronicling America is a Library of Congress website and all of Vermont, Vermont is digitized. Um, so it was wonderful. We can go through Brattleboro uh, newspapers and there's a lot of talking about what's happening on this side of the river. Um, so that was a wonderful resource. Uh, so. I had a lot of questions, next. And I started grouping them into categories as, and then I would write a question on an index card. And as I found the answer to that question, I would stack under that index card. Um, and pretty soon I had a dining room table full of index cards. And so we couldn't eat at the dining room table for a while. Um, but today I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what I've uncovered to date. So, um, the images, when I talk about her early life, we don't have photos of her early life, but once we get to the work with the Humane Society, it's all her photos. Um, so I, we're gonna talk a little bit about her family life, her career, uh, and what Humane Societies were doing, work with animals, but also work with people. 
Next. So Jenny Bell Carter was born in Brattleboro, Vermont, January 5th, 1864. Her mother, Isabel Wheaton Bigelow, grew up in Brattleboro. Um, her father, Edward Carter, uh, was a bit of a character. So he was from New York City. He traveled the country a lot in his lifetime. His obituary is quite sensational in nature. So we're actually trying to figure out what's back from fiction. Um, he embellished, whoever wrote it, embellished a lot. Um, so he's said to have carried more scars than any other man who fought in the Civil War. Not just for wounds he received during the war, he was shot clean through the body three times at the same time and written up in medical journals, apparently. Um, but a lot of his injuries were from his childhood. So here's a running list. He was once buried under a pile of sand. He was once thrown from a cliff into a river. He was once kicked in the face by a horse and he carried scars on his face his whole life. Um, he once had to have seven bones removed from his foot after it was crushed in by an ox. And then as a teenager, one day he's watching <laughs> firemen, that's all before he's a teenager. He's watching firemen put out a fire and as they rush by with the equipment, they knocked him in the mouth and knocked out all his front teeth. So apparently he got sick of living on the East Coast at that point and decided to board a ship to go out to the West Coast where supposedly he fell from the mizzen mast of the ship, got caught up in the ropes and saved uh, from the <laughs> drowning. But uh, as funny as that all sounds, as we do research on her father, we are finding that he was in all of these places. <laughs> so maybe there's some, there's some truth to that. But when the Civil War breaks out, Edward was back on the East Coast. He joined the 19 Pennsylvania Volunteers, um, but he was upset. He wasn't getting enough action in the war. Uh -huh. Somebody told him, if you come to Vermont, you'll get more action. So he comes to Vermont to re-enlist in the war. Um, and that's when he meets his wife, Isabel. And they get married and he fathers Jen. So um, Isabel's 20, he's 21. He re-enlists with his four brothers. And it said that between the five Carter boys, they participated in 200 battles during the war. So to recap her earliest years, Jenny's father's in and out of her life fighting in a war. And when he returned, he's medically discharged. Uh, he resumes life as an artist and he moves the family to Ontario. Jenny's five years old at the time. Um, and soon she has four little brothers. So the only hint of what I heard she was like as a child comes from a comment she made in a newspaper later in life. She said that as a child, um, other kids hated her because she used to fill her pockets with bugs and snakes. <laughs> but, yeah, but something happens. Jenny's parents divorced. Her father stayed in Canada, remarried, had another family. Her mother returned with the five children to Brattleboro to raise them. So back in Vermont, as a teenager, Jenny is 16 years old, at home, not in school. And she takes up new hobbies as any teenage girl would. Next. But for Jenny, that's hunting and entomology. <laughs> so already at this time, she's good with a gun. Um, and so the 1890s to the 1920s is really the dawn of this new gun culture in America with the advent of interchangeable parts to standardize the process of gun manufacturing. The cost of guns had decreased significantly. And so the sale of guns increased dramatically. And as a result, the sport of hunting as a leisure time activity developed. So by the late 19th century, many in rural New Hampshire and Vermont were participating in the sport, especially when you consider the work week is slowly going down to about 40 hours a week. That gives more leisure time for hobbies. Um, and at the same time the cost is going down, so too is the weight of guns. And so many more women are taking up the sport as well. So Jenny is hunting as a means of collecting specimens, small mammals. So she spends one year in Amherst, Massachusetts to take anatomy and entomology classes at the Massachusetts College of Agriculture. And it's during one of these visits in 1881 at the age of 17, she meets and marries a farm laborer, Frank Arthur Powers of Corinth, Vermont. Next. So soon after their marriage, the young couple move out to Colorado. 
Jenny gave birth to a daughter, but unfortunately she died as a toddler. A couple of years later, they moved back to Vermont. They have another daughter who dies as a baby. So Jenny Powers is a motherless woman in the late 1800s. So she's also living at a time when the national birth rate is on a steady decline. So during this era, more couples were choosing not to have as many children. Some historians attribute it to the fact that more families are living urban lifestyles, less agricultural. Some attribute it to the higher cost of living, the higher cost of rearing children in the early 20th century. But also it's an era where some middle and upper class women are actually choosing to have less children or no children at all, instead favoring a career. We don't know if Jenny made that choice or if that choice was made for her. Next. So whatever may have happened to the Powers children, it certainly prompted Jenny to seek out a new kind of career for herself. She became obsessed with her hobbies. In 1889, the Brattleboro newspaper notes that Mrs. Powers is out shooting rattlesnakes and black snakes again. <laughs> <laughs> and she writes to a friend that people take issue with her ability to shoot. Uh, but she really doesn't seem to care. So what did Mr. Powers think of the, all of this? Her husband really seems to have entertained this love of animals. Um, it may be how they met. When she reestablishes the uh, Vermont SPCA in Brattleboro, he's attending meetings with her. He helps construct a special cage for breeding insects so she can study larvae. And so this may be what drew them together in the first place. Next. By the 1890s, there's natural history enthusiasts and natural history clubs all over the place. Museums are opening to study natural history. Colleges are teaching more courses on the study of nature and anatomy of animals and insects. And we find that Jenny is said to have studied anatomy, zoology, entomology, and veterinary surgery. She also collected specimens she was collecting insects for a professor at Wellesley College, who was the leading expert on locusts in the day. Um, UMass Amherst actually has four letters written by Jenny Powers to the head of the entomology department at the Massachusetts College of Agriculture. And these letters sound like a teenage girl writing fan mail to a movie star. <laughs> she shares with this professor all the things she's collecting, her love of learning, her love of everything he does, and her strong desire to become his assistant because she had heard he was going to hire a female lab assistant. Um, I didn't find proof that she left her husband to go do that, but she certainly seems to have wanted to. So in 1893, she donates 2,000 insects to the Brattleboro Natural History Society, which was housing its collection in the public library. So she helped create a free public natural history museum. She created exhibits on snakes, fish, frogs, lizards, and snails. So it's clear that after her children's death, she's going to dedicate time to studying animals and insects. And on at least two occasions, next in the late, this is not her, this is another Maxine, uh, Maxwell, it's, thank you, <laughs> Maxwell, who is another 19th century taxidermist. She opens a taxidermy business in their house. So she's helping supplement their income. And for her, she specializes in birds, but she's also doing small mammals. So later in her career as a Humane Society agent, Jenny Powers changed her attitude towards hunting for sport. She regretted her former hobbies, and she believed only in humane killing to end pain and suffering. Next. So this is an ad um, from the Vermont Phoenix. Mrs. F.A. Powers has resumed her work in taxidermy, giving special attention to setting up birds. And the Prokeo schools closed down next day. <laughs> Next. Okay. So, <laughs> so as it so happens, um, you know, birds was a hot topic of the day. And this is uh, not, you know, similarly around the same time, but Vermont was really a leading state in, in trying to end the killing of songbirds. Um, it passed an early law against it. 
So, and you have to think about why is it birds was a specialty. When you consider feathers used for hats, it was fashion. Um, and so Vermont was an early state to, to actually ban the use of songbirds for that. Uh, so that may have, you know, played into part of what she was regretting later on. Next. So this is a photo of Jenny Powers. Her first known case as an agent for the Vermont Humane Society was on April 27, 1898. She reportedly marched into a logging camp in Athens, Vermont to inspect their horses. She became known regionally quite quickly for her no-nonsense approach to her work. Uh, in September of 1903, she gave a, a talk in Keene, New Hampshire, and by November, they hired her as the Humane Society agent there um, as well. So she was working in Vermont Wyndham County, Vermont, and Cheshire County, New Hampshire at the same time as an agent. And this was a position that the president of the Keene Humane Society said was an experiment to hire a woman. And so Jenny's commuting back and forth in those early years, but later she just moves to Keene. She leaves her husband, and she seems to have been living in an apartment that was an attached to the Humane Society, which was right downtown at the time. So by 1905, uh, within two years of working there, Massachusetts newspapers are noting that Deputy Sheriff Jenny B. Powers is in town to arrest a man for abusing his work animals. <laughs> so county reports don't tend to mention her appointment to Deputy Sheriff, uh, and the local newspapers don't mention it as well, uh, not too often, but she is working as a Deputy Sheriff related specifically to Humane Society cases. And she had jurisdiction in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. So if anyone thought they were gonna swim the river, <laughs> they got away from her, uh, she would follow. So by 1910, Jenny Powers filed for divorce from her husband, Frank, citing intolerable severity. So, on whose part? Yeah, well, he, he married again um, and then his second wife divorced him for a similar thing, and then he married a third time, and the third wife divorced him for a similar thing. So, hello, <laughs> learner. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> um, this photo here is is a, a factory in Keene. Keene was uh, pretty famous for its Kingsbury toys. Uh, and so here's women working in the factory there. We have 250 of them uh, on display, um, many of them on display at our place, if you ever want to come see. So during the progressive era, professional jobs are opening up more and more to women. In fact, uh, historians have found that of the 572 occupations listed in the 1920 census, women were employed in 537 of them. 94%. So while you think that most jobs were probably open to women included teacher, midwife, dressmaker, nurse, domestic, there are women that are entering the field elsewhere. And I began to see instances of county sheriff's departments hiring female deputies in the early 1880s. Next. So in 1881, a Texas headline read, Austin has a female deputy sheriff and the men don't know how to respond. <laughs> so here's a photo of two that I found. It's very hard to find photos of these women um, around the country. But what I discovered is that sheriffs are most often deputizing family, their wives and their daughters. So these women were often portrayed as confident, lacking any sense of fear, good with a revolver, yet feminine. <laughs> so in 1910, an Illinois female deputy sheriff left her high society function at midnight in her evening gown to serve papers to a man in bed. <laughs> and in West Virginia, a female deputy sheriff chased a gang of outlaws into the mountains, captured the chief outlaw, and then married him. <laughs> so... While fulfilling their roles then as deputy sheriffs, a lot of these women are involved in progressive era reforms. So newspapers interviewed women about their role in prison reform, child labor reform, asylum reform, uh, the temperance 
movement, who better to guard the liquor the police confiscate than the <laughs> female deputy sheriff? Um, and Jenny Powers is doing that as well. She, so she's using her role to participate in a movement to prevent cruelty to animals and family violence. Now in 1912, a New York City sheriff was interviewed about his decision to hire female deputies. He was seeking women who were athletic, able, and conscientious. Able to supervise dance halls where young people were doing appalling things. <laughs> so here's a quote from him. I shall appoint an unlimited number of women deputies from 1,000 to 1,500 at least. I believe women will do just as good work as men ever did. And I'm doing this in the interest of humanity. Every woman appointed will wear a badge and will have the right to make arrests and call on any officer or citizen for assistance. These special deputies will get no salary unless assigned to some special duty. Yeah, but they may carry a revolver and use it too if they like. One of their duties will be to keep peace on election day. So <laughs> this gives you some insight into the role that women had in the profession, the connection between their work as deputies and the role that they were playing as public housekeepers. Jenny Powers was already getting paid by the Humane Society, so I don't find her on Cheshire County payroll. Um, so, but she wasn't the only one in New Hampshire. So let's go to our next slide because Jenny, this is a photo of Jenny Kendall, uh, who was working in Nashua. So um, I believe Jenny Powers was the first woman in New Hampshire to get deputized, 1905. Jenny Kendall, however, uh, was close behind. She was a comrade and a friend of Jenny Powers in Nashua. And she was appointed a deputy sheriff and working for the Humane Society there in 1906. She too was petite, she was five feet tall. And a woman with no fear. So the main body of her work related to putting an end to cockfighting and dogfighting in New Hampshire. It's in a Delaware newspaper where I find her mention in 1907. Once alerted, Jenny Kendall would warn cockfighters of an impending raid prior to a game. Not everyone felt it necessary to heed her warning. On one occasion, she confronted a cockfighter and told him to shut down the game. He laughed, shoved her to the ground, and said, you run home and tend to your baking, little woman. Jenny Kendall immediately blew a whistle and a small army of police swarmed the area, <laughs> arresting the man as well as everyone else who was there betting. So they were in court and prosecuted the next day. Soon after, all cockfighting and dogfighting ceased in the Nashua area, as reported in the New York Tribune in 1907. <laughs> yes. So the two Jennies kept in touch with each other throughout their careers. They gave each other leads on cases. And in 1906, Jenny Kendall is the one who presents Jenny Powers with an award for her work on behalf of the Massachusetts SPCA. And in the newspaper article written in 1906, the one we saw earlier, where she's already being known as the woman who dares and it goes Associated Press across the country, she's also known already um, as having arrested more men than any other woman in the country. <laughs> So, next. Damn, I was born too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Jenny Powers came in in the early 1900s, but the Keene Humane Society um, is one of the older humane societies in the country. It was founded in 1875 to alleviate cruelty to animals. Um, and this is a photo of her here in Keene. From its earliest days, it was dedicated to protecting work animals. Work animals used on farms and logging camps, factory yards, daily use in the streets. Work animals like horses and oxen were often being overworked, even if the animal was injured. Society agents saw it was their duty to collaborate with municipal police and sheriff's offices to inspect work sites and personal homes and chase abusers through the streets to bring owners of abused animals to justice. We have lots of stories that have come to us since I've been giving this talk 
um, people who were children and hearing their parents talk about Jenny Powers and most of those stories of Jenny running through the streets and takes after somebody. She once jumped out of a window and took the sash and everything with her to, to, um, to attack a guy who was attacking his horse. So, um, so those stories are still around, which is really um, incredible. Next. So horse abuse cases constitute the bulk of what I've seen with her work. And you have to consider the crucial role the horse played in New Hampshire at the time she was working. Horses powered vehicles and were used on farms and at factories. They were used by police and fire departments. They were kept in every square inch of a city from hotels to homes. So they were necessary for freight movement, public transportation, emergency services, and personal use. Consider to the sheer number of horses there were in New Hampshire in the early part of the 20th century. The US federal census shows us that there were approximately 376,000 horses in New Hampshire in the year 1900. In their article, uh, 2008 article, The Horse as Urban Technology, Joel Tarr and Shane McLean argue that horses were much more likely to be treated as a machine rather than as a fellow mammal at the turn of the 20th century. Because even in death, a horse remained a commodity. Hides for soap, leather, excuse me, hair furniture for stuffing, muscles for pet food, fat for soap. And so at times in our past, it was actually more profitable for owners to simply work their horses to death since the carcass might actually be worth more than a live animal. Next. Uh, I should say, if you don't mind, go back. So, yeah. Oh, no, go back. Oh, this was just an advertisement for, yeah, let us tan your hide. So it was requesting, requesting hides, um, like, like horse, whatever it would be, deer, dog, calf, they, they took everything. Um, but just an example of what was happening. Okay, next. Um, it's hard to see, but this is a logging camp and these are horses she's tracking. But um, Jenny took notes on the back of all of her photos. She was documenting her visits that she made to businesses and homes. She was diagnosing animals ailments and the horses she needed to put down. So most of the time these photos depict horses in terrible shape. In some instances, she was photographing corpses, weapons, pieces of horses that were removed as evidence in order to prosecute. So Jenny Powers, to me, was really a photographic activist in her day. She meticulously used the power of her camera and her journaling to document evidence of abuse in the Connecticut River Valley. So during the industrial era with growing urbanization and increased poverty, Photographers sought to document social ills. Think Jacob Rees, Lewis Hyde, Dorothea Lange is all good examples of that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Jacob Rees, the next photo. Some of you may recognize um, one of his photos here. But in 1887, he began documenting urban poverty in one of the worst slums in the Lower East Side, New York City. More than 1 million people living in poorly kept tenement buildings. Through lectures and exhibits and publications of his photos, he hoped to show the middle and upper class the horrible living conditions um, of others and make a case for both tenement reform and child labor reform. He had been a police reporter for the New York Herald, and he had realized that photography was, quote, evidence that exceeded words. In December of 1905, while on a speaking tour, Jacob Rees spoke in Brattleboro to the Women's Club. In his lecture, he would have presented statistics, facts on immigration, population density, maternal deaths, police statistics, and what could be done to solve the problems. As he saw it, the other half didn't want to live that way and they didn't have to. So I'm dying to know if Jenny Powers went to that talk um, I have to wonder, because at some point around the same time, in 1905, too, she starts to use a camera, and it's a powerful tool for documenting her work. So um, photographs could speak for her when nobody would listen to her as a woman. 
photographs could counteract accusations that were being made against her. Next. Um, I will add that we have a wonderful volunteer named Sandy whose only job it is twice a week is to come in and digitize photos for us. We have over 20,000 photos and she's done over 18,000 at this point. Um, this collection, she took her a while. She had to start and stop because mm -hmm. some of these uh, images are, are really um, awful. Jenny Powers' journals often stated word for word the interactions she had with the men and women she confronted. She wrote down the amount of time someone made her wait to be heard, <laughs> realizing that quite often she's up against uh, men and women who didn't want a woman telling them what to do with their property with their spouses, with their children. She's often made to wait long hours for lawyers, judges, sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, veterinarians who didn't wanna work with her. She had difficulty getting witnesses to testify, people who could validate what she was accusing someone of doing. So as noted in her journaling, she's often confronted with a he said, she said scenario regarding a case. And yet she becomes someone who's arrested more men than any other woman in the country, supposedly, and is known throughout the country as the woman who dares. So I would say if Jenny Powers were a superhero, her camera and her journals are her sword and her shield. Um, not to mention the fact she liked to carry a gun. That probably <laughs> um, I will say word for word is accurate. She would say, he called me this swear, and then I called him that, mm -hmm. and she was really, meticulous with her note taking. Um, <laughs> so similar to Jacob Reese, Jenny Powers did exhibit her photos for the public on at least one occasion that I found. And she often brought photos with her to her lectures. She lectured around New England, inviting people to take notice and exposing a truth. Uh, next. Now, Jenny was famous for her work with cattle trains. She's said to have stopped every single train that came through Keene. It's work that the Humane Society began before she started there. Railroads had been filtering across the country in, in the 1800s, and railroad companies were being singled out for their poor treatment of livestock. The 1873 law, called the 28-hour law, sought to prevent cramming too many animals into a car, not resting animals in transit, not providing food or water, or leaving livestock in train cars to freeze to death overnight in the winter. So companies could get fined $100 to $500 per violation. Next. Jenny Powers was often the one to climb down into railroad cars herself, filled with livestock to inspect the health of the animals. She could force trains to stay longer, to let animals out, to rest, and to eat. And at least one instance, the Boston and Maine Railroad tried to force her to pay for the money they had lost, having to stop and rest animals, as well as the fines they received. But I do not think it worked. Next. Now, aside from horses and cattle, Jenny Powers was assisting a lot of animals. Um, she was accessible 24-7. The Humane Society, as I mentioned, was on Main Street, which overlooked the railroad yard. So it was quite easy to see if the train was coming into town. Um, but everybody knew where she lived. Uh, and so uh, if you had an, a pet that you needed to put down, you could take it to her to do that. Um, and she seems to have put down a lot of cats in, in her journals. And she reached a point where she insisted that she alone euthanize any animal in the region because she knew then that the animal would be put down in a humane manner. So I have a few photos here of, of other animals from our collection. Oh, she's like, she's like oh, your <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, domesticated, <laughs> wildlife like a fox. Um, in this instance, there was an abandoned farm, as you can imagine, at the turn of the 20th century. A lot of families were moving out west and abandoning farms. Um, this guy had to wrangle all the turkeys that were at this farm, and he doesn't look too pleased about it. <laughs> Next. 
and they're inspecting sites like this. This was a barn uh, that was housing livestock. Oh. Um, and so the Humane Society would have to go in and inspect uh, to make sure the animals were okay. okay. And this, you can see her silhouette down there, but she's uh, documenting a weapon that was used against a horse. Wow. All right, now, now uh, we're gonna discuss work with people uh, so Jenny was also investigating cases of family violence and neglect. Next. So in, uh, until the progressive era, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of strong protections for women and children against abuse. And it was generally perceived that spousal abuse, otherwise known as domestic chastisement, was allowable because a woman's legal status was directly connected to her husband, to her brother, to her father, so by law, she was subservient and dependent. And it was generally felt that God had given man the right to correct wives through physical punishment. Progressive era reformers, mostly women, began to argue for government intervention in cases of spousal abuse, because to protect the wife was to protect the stability and success of the family as a whole. But it took a really long time for that change to come. Even in 1910, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a wife could not file assault and battery charges against a husband because it would open the floodgates and make private issues public. So it took 10 more years for spousal abuse to become illegal in all states in 1920. Now, humane societies and SPCAs were some of the first organizations to support these kinds of reforms. And why is that? Because quite quickly, these are the organizations that were finding that animal cruelty was going hand in hand with spousal abuse and child abuse. These agents had a backdoor entry into the home to see what else was happening. And the first case, um, the first organization to pay for a lawyer to take on a child abuse case was in New York, and it was the SPCA of New York. In 1894, the American Humane Society adopted a new slogan. The man who is cruel to his beast would be cruel to his wife and child. The cases that Jenny Powers was investigating, more often than not, related to children, not to spouses. I do see instances where she escorted wives and children to the county farm in Westmoreland, but a lot of times what she's able to do is just check in periodically, check on the wife. On one occasion, she was able to arrest a man after noticing the poor condition of the home. The family was living in a small shack, and she writes that the wife's hair hadn't been combed for years. It was completely matted into one knot. So in that instance, the husband was considered neglectful of his duty to provide proper shelter and care for his family, and that was grounds for her to be able to do something. Next. Oh, this is just an image of Cheshire County. She was documenting a lot of small shacks that would pop up in the backs of people's property. Next. So in another instance, uh, with this family in particular, Jenny's visiting the home. There's five children and the husband's been beating the wife. So every time she visits, she's making notes on the back of this photograph. Um, and in her final note on the back of this photo, she indicates that two of the youngest sons eventually take a shotgun and kill their father. Oh, wow. wow. Next. So Jenny Powers' battle with social evils more often than not led her to protect the rights of children in the Monadnock region and in Vermont. Her camera was used to document children, but not in the same way we see she depicted animals. We do not have photos of children with no clothes on covered in bruises. We do have photos of children outside smiling and safe. So like Lewis Hines photos of children working in factories, Jenny's photos look us, force us to look directly into their eyes, to consider their health and their education and their futures. These images of children could be anyone's child. And to me, these photos create a feeling of shared humanity. During the progressive era, a judge could intervene in family matters only if the child was exposed to neglect by his or her parents. In cases of neglect, the state had the right to take children out of the home. Neglect became illegal where corporal punishment was still legal. 
neglect came in two forms, either physical or moral. Moral neglect meant a child was exposed to drug and alcohol consumption. Children of a certain age were sharing beds with adults. Children were participating in adult activities such as gambling or begging in the streets. Moral neglect could also indicate sexual immorality on the part of a parent, a parent cheating. Physical neglect might be a lack of clothing, a lack of supervision, food, medical care, or a lack of cleanliness in the home. So in many instances, Jenny would inspect families' homes and instruct them on cleanliness and provide warnings that she's going to return and check their home situation at a later date. If the home wasn't to her liking, she would remove the children. Next. Um, this is a gypsy woman staying at the Cheshire Fairgrounds as, as quoted on the back of the photo. Um, the problem with these issues of physical neglect though, uh, is that what constituted neglect is very much based on middle-class standards of living, which isn't as accessible to poor families. These cases too don't factor in stress that parents were under trying to make ends meet. And as a result, parents are often vilified for their poverty rather than assisted. So it wasn't until individual states and the federal government became more involved in these types of issues that humane societies and SPCAs began to refocus their attention back to animals. In Keene, I see that in about the mid 1920s, they uh, hired a, <coughs> Grace Richardson was her name, a public welfare um, agent who would help as well. Next. So during the progressive era, humane societies worked with local law enforcement to relocate abused and neglected children to other homes. Often the first way to do that was to hand children over to family living in the area. But Jenny also developed this really amazing network of families within the county um, willing to take children in. So often if there was a child being abused in one part of the county, she would make sure to find a home on the other side of the county just to give some space. Next. As a child was removed from the home, a judge would determine whether it was temporary or permanent. Jenny would be called in to, as a witness to testify. And for temporary cases, they were placed with a family or in an institution until the parents could get back on their feet. This is a photo of a, a a reunification of a family. And so for permanent cases, though, Jenny became a guardian of a child and would find placement in another home or in an institution. And then often she's the one keeping touch with them until they turn 18. Next. So there's a variety of institutions for children in New Hampshire. And we see that the Keene Humane Society is sending children to live at the county farm in Westmoreland the Industrial School in Manchester, Children's Home in Franklin, the State Hospital in Concord, and the New Hampshire School for the Feeble-Minded in Laconia. And still other children were put up for adoption. So it wasn't uncommon to find in the classified section of a newspaper besides something as mundane as sewing machine for sale, a notice, baby up for adoption, comes from good stock, see Mrs. Powers. Next. Here's an example of one of those, the Brattleboro Daily Reformer, 1917, wanted people to adopt a fine boy, weak old, good parentage, Jenny Powers, Keene, New Hampshire. Now, adoption's a tricky game. We've learned that state and federal government rarely came between parents and children until the mid-19th century. But by the time Jenny was around and working, courts are really relying on these progressive reform agencies for help. There's a strong partnership between the two to place children in other homes. Now, adoptions occurred for a lot of reasons. Next. Not just for abuse in the home. Sometimes it might be financial hardship or an illness or a death of a parent. All of these things cause parents to consider sending their child to live in someone else's care. But it's important to remember too that there's a very strong stigma tied to adoption. There was a stigma related to bringing a child of a different financial standing into your home, a different race or ethnicity, or a different religion into your home, such as a Protestant family taking in a Catholic child. And unfortunately, 
Cases of incest are not uncommon at the turn of the 20th century. This here are children who were faced with that. In one case in the Monadnock region, a young girl was removed from the home because she was the victim of incest by her father. Jenny Powers relocated her to a home on the other side of the county, hoping to provide stability to the girl's life. The extended family immediately began arguing with the Humane Society to take over her care. Meanwhile, the new school um, where she, this girl was attending promptly removed her because they didn't want other children exposed to a girl who had had sexual relations with a man. The girl was 10 years old. She had been labeled by many in the community as sexual deviant, highlighting another uncaring part of our historic past. So in this one case, Jenny Powers was fighting the parents, the extended family, and the school. And you have to wonder how this little girl coped with the trauma of her life experiences on top of the stigma tied to her situation. Next. So there's still a lot of material to go through to learn about Jenny Powers and all the lives she touched. She averaged between 250 and 350 cases a year. She continued to work at the Humane Society from 1903 to 1936 when she died of a long-term illness. Some say because she just didn't take care of herself. <laughs> um, yeah, because she was so accessible, her journals will say often she's up till three in the morning working on cases and then she had to be up at five to go to court. So she was just, this was her life. She didn't have children, she didn't have her husband. This was it. So I often get asked the question if she was a, uh, um, a suffragist and I was like I don't think she had time to be a suffragist but once women got the right uh to register to vote she was third in line uh, so yeah so the things are on her mind I think uh she did die of pneumonia uh she's remembered for her dedication to the lives of others both animal and human to the point that she sacrificed her own health and her own safety there's another newspaper article we have um where she's being interviewed because she's receiving death threats. She sleeps with a gun under her pillow. Um, and the headline is something like, just let him try it. Uh, <laughs> so as we learned, humane societies began in the mid to late 19th century. And by the turn of the 20th century, we're taking on cases associated with people, with families. So Jenny is probably just one example of a new woman stepping out of the home to save America from itself. She's saving animals, women, and children in her community. Uh, in the short time next that we've been sharing her story, I started giving this talk in 2019. Um, local schools are now sharing her life story with students. In 2019, over 200 artists from around the world descended on Keene to paint 16 historically themed murals across our cityscape. The topics were selected by public vote from community members. So the Historical Society was asked to help come up with about 30 topics. And then we rented out a space downtown that was empty and the public had so many days to come in and vote for their favorite topics. Nobody had ever heard of Jenny Powers, What's next. But she received the most number of votes by residents in our area allowing her life to be memorialized as a mural in downtown Keene. So people now see her as this amazing, powerful, gunslaying, <laughs> progressive era woman standing up against abuse. Every time my daughters and I walk by, we stop and salute. <laughs> um, the Historical Society, we give tours of all the wall dogs murals um, every, every summer, uh, spring to fall. So you're always welcome to come and do a field trip. Next. And in 2001, the Daughters of the American Revolution awarded her a Women in History Award and presented it to the Monadnock Humane Society. So our Monadnock Humane Society is the Keene Humane Society. It's still in operation today. And next. Um, and Salt. So Product, uh, Salt Project is a production, film production company that had moved to Keene just as the pandemic hit. Um, it came to see one of one of the talks that I gave and decided to make a mini documentary I mentioned before. So these are shots from that. And because I mentioned that my daughters always salute, uh, they got to be in the film. Uh, so our daughters are in the film. 
<clears throat> and as I mentioned, it still plays on New Hampshire Public Television and Vermont Public Television um, and was submitted for a New England Academy Award. So um, I think next month they vote on that. But um, next. But there's one last thing I just want to mention before we're done, and that's just to recognize how important this Humane Society collection is for understanding widespread poverty and abuse in regions of our state. So in 26 years in this field, archive and museum preservation, I've never seen a photo collection that documents an alternate existence in our local history like this one does. Because quite often we're portraying the better part of history because that's what's been donated to mm -hmm. us our state historical societies and museums, our collections are only as good as what we get. And most often we're receiving family celebrations, parades down Main Street, uh, ribbon cutting ceremonies for a new business. We don't tend to receive evidence of heartbreak and struggle. And I really believe that Jenny Powers has given us all a gift because she reminds us that difficult times are not new, poverty and abuse are not new, and she provides us with a means of building historical empathy across time and space where I think that's really especially needed in our society today. Next. Um, this here is a photograph she took of a chicken coop in Cheshire County um, with enough space only for a mattress and there was a man and two, his two children living here. So, um, and, and that is all for me. So I thank you.